Hello, everyone. Uh, as you get settled into your Zoom chairs, um, I would just like to go over a couple housekeeping items. Um, first, I would like to note that uh, this presentation tonight will be recorded for future use. So please act accordingly. Um, next, for the best viewing experience, uh, go to the upper right hand corner of your Zoom screen and make sure that you are in the presenter view uh, and not the gallery view. Also, it is worth noting um, that you are currently defaulted on mute, but that your camera may still be live. So please adjust your video settings to what you are most comfortable with. Um, you can adjust your video settings by clicking the video camera button on the toolbar. Finally, I want to mention that our speaker will uh, take some time to answer questions at the end of their presentation, but that you can type a question uh, for Dave at any point during the presentation. Just use the chat function, um, which you can also find on the toolbar under the more button. Um, at the appropriate time, I will monitor the chat box and pass those questions on to Dave. Um, now, for those of you who don't know, my name is Daniel Center, and I am the Community Conservation Coordinator for the Methow Conservancy. Uh, we are a nonprofit land trust and environmental education organization whose mission is to inspire people to care for the land of the Methow Valley. If you like what you see here tonight, I encourage you to visit our website or check out our most recent e-newsletter for a rather exciting organizational update, as well as information on upcoming events like our March conservation course, Overlooked, uh, which will focus on how underrepresented peoples and communities shape the past, present, and future of the Methow Valley. At this moment, it is important for us to pause and reflect on the fact that the Methow Conservancy and the Cascades Wolverine Project do our work on the traditional homelands of the Chelan, Okanagan, and Methow people. And as tonight's snow quietly masks our collective memory of 2020, I encourage folks to put away the baggage of the past year and any ongoing election coverage and be prepared to be transported to, to a place that is close to all of our hearts, the North Cascades. For four seasons, Steph Williams, Drew Lavelle, and Dave Moskowitz under the banner of the Cascades Wolverine Project have been venturing into our backyard mountains to study, document, and tell the story of our local Wolverine population. Utilizing their combined skills in science, photography, mountain guiding, and storytelling, this team is making sure that our state's most elusive carnivore is not forgotten. We are super lucky to hear from Dave tonight. He is currently in Chelan, waiting for the morning Lady of the Lake ferry to take him to meet Steph and Drew in the village of Holden to begin this winter's field season. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Dave Moskowitz. Great, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, to see a bunch of familiar faces and some folks that I don't know. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you guys and um, we'll get started here. I trust uh, Daniel, you'll tell me if anything goes uh, awry here, but I'll just assume that things are rolling. Um, it's really great to uh, be out tonight and uh, share some stories from the field and uh, share a little bit about this creature, the, uh, the Wolverine, which is near and dear to many of our hearts and uh, a little bit about the work that we're doing and some of the current research that some of our contemporaries are up to as well. Uh, and um, I'll try to answer any questions that I can um, at the end of this if, uh, 
to confuse you about anything. Um, I just want to um, start with just actually some words of gratitude and um, thinking about um, some Thanksgiving just before we get started with the meat of the text or the meat of uh, what I've got to share tonight. And uh, as Daniel already alluded to, um, all of our work at the Cascades Wolverine Project that Steph Drew and I do and all of our volunteers that work with us in the field do is on uh, Chelan and Metau territory and truly the amazing natural um, biodiversity that we experience and, and cherish in the North Cascades is thanks to um, hundreds of generations of stewardship of people that came before us. And um, just feeling gratitude for that. And honestly, gratitude that I get to live and work and play in such a beautiful landscape, especially in uh, trying times. It's always nice to know that there's such a, a beautiful and welcoming place to, to call home. Um, I also just wanna recognize that the work we're doing, everything we talk about cannot be done in a vacuum. We're a grassroots uh, project. We've bootstrapped our way up, but we've had a lot of support along the way, including all of these organizations. Uh, and, um, and just wanna shout out thanks to them. And like a lot of our work, we try to collaborate and support the work of other folks, fill in holes and um, uh, ongoing research of others and uh, try to you know, enhance the conservation work of other organizations as well. Um, I want to also recognize all of our volunteers and individual donors. And um, uh, here's a, Lexi is a, uh, um, in this photo is a local to the Metau and uh, she was out with us a bunch, as well as a bunch of other folks, including a number of other people on this call. Um, so those of you that have volunteered your time with us, we're really grateful. And we've had a ton of individual donors as well that have given us um, everything from five bucks to multiple thousands of dollars to allow us to do our field work. And just really grateful that uh, we feel like we've got a bigger team than just the three of us for sure, because of all the folks that participate through their support, um, either as volunteers or through um, sending us finances and kind of working with us vicariously in that way. So gratitude to all of you guys as well. And then of course, I'll talk more about our community science project at the end that involves people doing Wolverine research that we're kind of helping coordinate really up and down the Washington Cascade. So there's community scientists far and wide and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we're grateful for all the contributions that you guys uh, give as well. Um, so that being said, um, I think I'll, we'll just drop right in. And for me, I just wanted to start with this image because for me, this says a lot about um, the project and what we're doing and why we're doing it. And um, and I think many folks from the Metau will recognize the Liberty Bell Massif there. And, um, and there's a Wolverine in the foreground. And this is a, a place that we know and love. It's a place that's been important to people as long as people have been on this landscape, I feel pretty confident to say such a just a beautiful and special spot. And, and really, we're interested in how we as humans live in this environment and affect wolverines and what wolverines have to share with us about uh, what it means to live lightly on the land and how we as humans get along with wolverines and other creatures on the landscape. And then how to tell their story, take the story of this wolverine that lives in the headwaters of the Metau River and bring its story out to a larger audience so that uh, uh, her needs can be you know, reflected in the, in the conversation and discourse of our society, which is gonna have such a huge role in her future. So um, with that in mind, just to share, like our goals for this, for Cascades Wolverine Project are one, to help monitor Wolverine populations. We actually don't know a ton about Wolverines in the Washington Cascades. It's very much an unfolding story. I'll talk about some new installations to this, uh, the new like little insights we got over the past year from uh, some of our colleagues that have been doing other research uh, elsewhere in the Cascades in, in a little bit, but we're just trying to fill in some gaps. We're a small project. There's other folks um, uh, such as uh, the Woodland Park Zoo and um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and Cascades uh, Carnivore Project that have, and Conservation Northwest that are doing a much bigger um, direct kind of monitoring effort. We're kind of trying to fill in some gaps in places that 
uh, would would go left um, unmonitored uh, without us there. And then trying to be responsive when we get uh, information that there might be a good spot to try to do a little bit more professional monitoring. We'll try to fill in some of those gaps. Uh, we're doing a lot of what we're doing is trying to uh, create images and video content and story narratives to help communicate the science and the ecology to a larger audience and, and develop a sense of uh, shared passion and responsibility for the alpine environment and wolverines in particular. And then the other thing which has been a growing part of our project is our community science project, which is really to turn all of you, anybody that goes outside recreating in wolverine habitat into a community scientist. Uh, we want you to help be the eyes and ears uh, for us as we try to sort out what's the story with wolverines in the Cascades. And we'll talk more about that as well. That's been a really exciting and growing part of our work. So um, I know you guys won't be able to hear the sound for this. So it's really kind of a teaser. Um, but if you go uh, onto our website, uh, you will be able to, um, on the team live. So these are our local mountains. Uh, you'll be able to um, watch the trailer that was put together by uh, um, Wild Confluence Media for a video that's forthcoming, perhaps this spring or summer about our work. And uh, so I'll just let you see some of the, of what will be in there to tell a little bit more of the story. Um, I believe Daniel's going to drop the URL to go straight to it on Vimeo, but you can find it at our website as well, cascadeswolverineproject.org. Um, so that's out there. And one of the projects that's coming uh, for um, the visual storytelling part of our work. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the monitoring work that we're doing. Uh, and um, this is actually a day in the field for uh, the project. It looks pretty lovely. It was a lovely day. You might also imagine this is what we're doing all day out there on our skis looking for wolverines and trying to photograph them. And occasionally there are blissful moments like this, but in reality, actually a lot of what we're doing uh, looks like a lot of logistics and hauling stuff from one place to another. Uh, this was last year going into the uh, Holden Village on the ferry and there's a um, uh, Nick March and uh, Michael um, Boeing, uh, as well as Steph on the left there. Uh, Nick and Mike were volunteers for us last year. And uh, um, it might look like this, uh, hauling even more stuff in on snowmobiles. We use um, them to get to some of our sites. And then once we get there, it's not all just beautiful ski touring and powder. There's a lot of time handling um, roadkill deer, which is, um, the attractant we use to lure carn uh, wolverines into our research stations so that we can get photographs of them and hopefully genetic samples. Uh, a lot of tree climbing, mostly Steph does that as well. Uh, we set up weird contraptions to try to snag a few hairs from the wolverines for those genetic samples we talked about. And um, we set up kind of intricate uh, cameras to take really nice photographs of the wolverines if they come to visit. It's a, kind of like a little studio session for wolverine. And uh, I would say that um, wolverines aren't the most um, agreeable models when it comes to, you know, getting talent for a studio photography shoot, but we do what we can with them. There's Erica Engel, another one of our volunteers and mountain guide um, uh, helping set up a flash there. So that's a little bit about kind of like what we do. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about wolverines. And I know there's a few folks that have seen me present on wolverines in the past. So I'll try to keep this like a, a brief synopsis, but I'm sure there's new folks out there as well, new to Gulo Gulo. The gluttonous glutton is the Latin name for these guys. And uh, just share a little bit about what makes this creature tick. And one thing to note that says a lot about wolverines is where they live. And um, perhaps you're familiar with this idea of climatic life zones uh, for folks that live on the east side of the Cascades. It's very obvious as you go from the shrub steppe into the dry forest, into the subalpine forest, and then into the alpine and tree line. And, and wolverines really occupy uh, that zone 
their preferred habitat is right on that tree line zone, kind of the subalpine into the alpine. They'll, they'll go up, they'll go down, but the best place to find them is right there. It's basically like spending uh, their lives up around the edge of the Arctic tundra in some ways, in terms of the types of conditions that they live with. So this would be a typical view for a wolverine on a, on a Wednesday afternoon while they're on their way to work, a um, place like this. And this is a, a part of the North Cascades out of Holden Village where we work. Um, and you can see there's Steph cruising through some wolverine habitat. We have to wear all sorts of funny contraptions on our bodies to allow ourselves to be safe and warm and uh, travel out in this landscape. But for wolverines, they do it with just their their feet and their fur and their wits. Um, and here's some of their tracks, right? And uh, this is like a, an avalanche fell field, um, right, you know, just kind of below tree line in the North Cascades. And this is the beautiful habitat for wolverines. Um, so why do wolverines spend so much time here? Well, essentially they're addicted to snow. Like many people that live in the Metau Valley, they love the snow. Um, for wolverines, though, it's not just a, a preference, it's a requirement. They're an obligate to landscapes that have a lot of snow. And we'll talk about just exactly how much snow and why that is in just a moment. Here's their current range in the dark, uh, darker pink, their historic range in the lighter pink. So this is a species you can actually find all across the northern hemisphere uh, of the world. And uh, traditionally, it was all across the boreal uh, life zone and then dipping down into the northern temperate regions uh, in North America and their eastern habitat has they've been extirpated from there and they've their habitat here in the Cascades and the Rockies has shrunk, although now it appears that their population is expanding a little bit again in the Cascades, which is exciting. Um, to give you a sense of how common they are. These are some estimates from a few years ago about numbers of people and uh, wildlife. And uh, we think of wolves as pretty rare. Well, at this point, they're probably three to four times more common than wolverines in Washington state, just to give you a sense of, of how common or uncommon these guys are. They, there's, um, they have very specific needs for the types of landscapes that they can live in. And uh, that's in limited supply here in Washington state. And then even within those landscapes, uh, they have huge home ranges that can cover, you know, a couple hundred square miles even for one wolverine. So not very many of them. Here's a, a video that uh, Stefan Drew caught of a wolverine from the Metau Valley. This is up Twist River. And this uh, wolverine was uh, feeding on a moose carcass. There's also wolf tracks around this. Possible that the wolves killed this moose and, and uh, or possibly it died from some other causes, but the wolverine showed to, up to, to scavenge on this carcass. And wolverines basically um, will eat any kind of meat they can get their hands on. Um, uh, they can hunt and kill things, but most of what they do is scavenge on things and they're kind of the cleanup crew. And I, I put bellwether here because they're also kind of an indicator of how um, well uh, an alpine environment is doing. If, if wolverines can survive in the mountain environment where they should be able to survive, then that's a pretty good sign that things are, are doing okay there as far as like there's enough prey and the climatic conditions are, are as they should be. Um, this is a species that's, uh, because it's in low density, is relatively sensitive to disturbances and um, uh, overhunting, um, trapping, things like that. So the fact that we have wolverines in the North Cascades, again, is a testament to the, the work that uh, many folks have done to preserve this ecosystem. Here's a skull of a wolverine. This is actually a skull that lives in the Burke Museum. And one thing I'd like you to take note of besides the extremely large teeth, uh, is the joint of the, um, the mandible into the cranium, which in wolverines is actually locked into place. You can't take them apart. And that is 
to give wolverines an extremely powerful jaw so they they can't just they literally cannot dislocate their jaw no matter how hard they bite so they have extremely powerful bite those big back teeth are really good at cracking bones and things like that and eating frozen meat and such so this is a, a creature with a, a disproportionately powerful bite uh, which is important this is what it looks like after a wolverine's done eating uh, these are mountain goat bones that were found uh, where I followed wolverine tracks into this is in the northern Rockies and it looked like a wolverine had been killed in a avalanche and a wolverine had been coming back to feed on it and was lingering around until it was chewing off the ends of the long bones and eating some of the bones and getting the marrow out of it so these uh, animals do not waste anything and they can make a meal out of just about anything this is actually the skull of a black bear. This was also in the Northern Rockies in Northwest Montana. Uh, and I was out with Swan Valley Connections on doing some of the research with them. And we followed wolverine tracks into a dead black bear carcass that was buried in the snow. And the wolverine was feeding on this black bear. No idea if it, if it killed her or if the, if the black bear was dead. But like I said, if it's meat and it's on the landscape, there's a pretty good chance a wolverine will find it and then uh, do its best to consume it, which allows them to survive in this really harsh environment. And actually, this is one of the things that snow provides for them most likely is a refrigerator. So when a big animal dies, uh, if it's hot out, that meat will spoil pretty quickly. And if it's left on top of the ground, it'll be easily found by other scavengers. But in the snow, uh, the snow acts as a freezer for it, a meat locker, essentially. And especially buried meat is, is hard to find for the few other scavengers that are up on the landscape. So this is an important food source and way for them to um, conserve their food. So without that snowpack, life would be a lot harder, if not impossible for wolverines in terms of feeding. The other reasons wolverines, the other reason wolverines are absolutely tied to snow is the fact that all natal dens, all dens that were made by females to raise young in North America, all of them that have ever been recorded were under the snow. Um, and the two ways that they're under the snow is either they're like in a deep um, snowy canyon bottom that's very well shaded and collects a lot of snow and then they'll burrow under a fallen log that's covered with snow like you can see here. Uh, that was a wolverine den. Um, or they'll burrow through the snow into a talus field way up high in the mountains, the talus field being big rocks uh, on the sides of mountains and they'll burrow through the snow into the talus and find a little space amongst the rocks to raise their young. So pretty much without um, snowpack that lasts into May, um, wolverines are not known to be able to successfully rear young. So they are, for this reason especially, they are absolutely tied to places with lots of snow. And that is possibly for um, uh, insulation, the snow acts as insulation for the young, but also probably as defense against other things that might uh, eat them or compete with them. Uh, so that snowpack cover, whatever the reasons, is vital for, for wolverines. Because of that, there's been a lot of research search done at this point looking at um, what are the climactic conditions, climatic conditions that are important for wolverines. And uh, snowpack is a pretty snowpack lasting into April or May is a pretty good surrogate to estimate where wolverines can call home. So here's a map of wolverine habitat here in the Cascades. And here's just a little blink into the areas that uh, we are doing um, research at this point on them. One thing to note is that you'll see there's a pretty good overlap between protected lands and federal lands and state lands and wolverine habitat. So they've got a lot of land that's not going anywhere, which is good for them, uh, but there's other threats to that habitat besides just downright, you know, outright development as you guys can imagine and I will talk about. One thing that was really interesting uh, in the news this year about wolverines uh, was the discovery um, of uh, a breeding, a second breeding female. This is the second time in recent 
years that a, a breeding female has been documented um, in the southern Washington Cascades. Both uh, of these observations were made by Jocelyn uh, Aikens at uh, Cascades Carnivore Project. And um, we were actually also lucky enough to, um, through our community science project, get a video clip sent us of some of these uh, young wolverines on Mount Rainier um, this summer. And uh, uh, that was actually released with Mount Rainier's press release. So wolverines have been in the news and this is kind of further evidence that um, we may um, at some point have a more stable population of wolverines, not just in the North Cascades, but possibly in the South Cascades. Um, and in Mount Rainier, also a spot where there's a lot of recreational traffic and we got a lot of observations of wolverines or wolverine tracks from around Mount Rainier this year, which was quite exciting. Mount Rainier being a spot that has lots of snow, so it would predictably make good habitat for wolverines. So um, just to talk a little bit about that connection, because as I mentioned, a lot of what we're doing is conservation oriented. These are two models. On the left is a model of um, snowpack. This is basically a model of wolverine habitat, you know, primarily defined by snowpack that persists into the spring. And on the left is a, is a more hopeful model with climate change. And the right is um, a less hopeful model of climate change. So if we do uh, little or nothing to stave off um, greenhouse gas emissions, we'll get something like on the right. If we can get somewhat of a handle on things, we'll get something more like on the left. Either way, you can see that wolverine habitat is retreating in the Cascades and elsewhere. And so while there's happy news and optimistic news like the discovery of uh, wolverines uh, south of I-90 right now, we're predicting that there's going to be big trouble for these animals because of climate change coming in the future. Um, and this is a point of great concern uh, for conservationists that are working on seeing this animal get um, some more official protection on a state and federal level. Of course, snowpack isn't just important to wolverines. It's very important to people as well, both for recreation and then also for our water supplies. Uh, so this is a shared interest, as I mentioned. And at Cascades Wolverine Project, we're not just interested in wolverines, but we're interested in people that live and use and depend on the places that wolverines uh, also live and depend on. And um, so this is a spot where we can have some shared empathy and shared concern. And, and um, there's a natural alliance between people that care about winter snow and people that care about wolverines. It's interesting to be involved with the research we're in because we use things like snowmobiles to get out to the places that uh, we do our research. And uh, obviously burning fossil fuels is a challenge that we're facing for, that wolverines are facing. And um, so the, the ethics of the work we do and the, the reality, the realization that we are not just sitting high on a hill here and doing conservation work where we get to tell other people what to do, but that we're both potentially a part of the problem as well as a part of the solution is part of our everyday work. Uh, with the Cascades Wolverine Project as we try to figure out what the future holds for all of us. Uh, the other interesting thing about what we do is that it's not just uh, when we're out burning fossil fuels that we may be creating challenges for wolverines. There's uh, some research out now that suggests that actually backcountry recreation, especially in the winter, can have negative impacts on wolverines. And um, the, and that includes both mechanized recreation, such as snowmobiling, which I think many people might not be surprised that lots of snowmobiles on the landscape might disturb wildlife, but it, it also suggests that really high amounts of um, quiet, non-motorized winter recreation might also have impacts on wolverine. And um, the thing that's most harmful apparently from the research that's been done is actually a random use of like off trail, off road, random use of the landscape. So when 
especially mechanized land. You know, so when you have snowmobiles that go off into high mountain areas and you and use them at unpredictable times uh, and but often that can um, really deter wolverines, but most especially female wolverines. So this is kind of an interesting thing where uh, the research found that male wolverines might use places that have a high degree of human recreational use, but the females won't. And functionally, that landscape becomes much less valuable for wolverines if females won't use it because that's the limiting factor on wolverine populations is denning habitat. And so we might even see a wolverine occasionally in places with lots of winter recreation, um, but that doesn't mean that things are okay for wolverines necessarily. Really, uh, we have to know, is that a male or a female? Is that female there regularly? Is she denning in this area? Or is this human use causing uh, wolverines to, uh, to stop denning in that area and functionally basically um, pushing them out of uh, being able to use it completely? Interestingly enough, this is the upper Hairpin Valley uh, close to Washington's pass over the past few years. We've seen a real big increase in all sorts of recreational use up there. Um, but um, definitely snowmobile use in places that used to be the sole domain of backcountry skiers, which has created some conflict between user groups of humans, um, but is probably also contributing to some stress for the wolverines that um, use this area. And we've documented wolverines in this exact spot multiple times, uh, although not in the last couple of years, which uh, uh, has us curious about whether the amount of use that's been going on in this area might be deterring um, their presence in this landscape. Uh, interestingly enough, um, just this year, some of you might know, is this kind of updates in the Wolverine world. Uh, very locally, this uh, that the Forest Service has announced some closures to snowmobile traffic in uh, off the Highway 20 corridor. And this was specifically to avoid um, negative interactions between different types of recreational users, skiers and, and snowmobilers. Uh, so I bet the skiers in the crowd will be happy about this. Uh, there may be some snowmobilers that are pretty disappointed about this. Uh, the Wolverines, uh, if I had a hazard to guess, are probably pretty pleased about this, although I think it still remains to be seen the growing levels of uh, ski traffic that are going on in these areas uh, may actually prove to be um, a detriment to wolverines as well. So this is something that all of us that are concerned about recreational access and survival of wolverines and the health of the alpine environment that we love and recreate and are, are watching very closely. Um, so I think I'm going to transition into just talking a little bit about what we found recently. So in this past year, so this is kind of an update. So many of you were on I've seen a presentation we did last year. And so just to share some of the highlights of the past field season, this was a Wolverine that we documented several times in the North Cascades out of the Holden uh, village area. Um, we got a beautiful view of this Wolverine's chest blaze. We don't know much about it. We got one hair sample from it, but we weren't able to get any results of, you know, from that one hair sample, unfortunately, to tell us anything more about this animal but we've seen its chest blaze on several photos. And uh, we know that it came, this one particular Wolverine came back to visit our field station at least twice last year and possibly more than that. And uh, so we're keeping track of this critter and uh, hopefully we'll be able to learn more about uh, this animal this coming winter, perhaps uh, what sex he or she is and uh, whether it's still using that, in that landscape. Um, here's another shot probably of that same wolverine, but we're not sure. Um, you can see it's got some white, white toes there, which is an interesting feature. Not all wolverines have white toes. Um, here's a Steph in the fall of last year. This is like a year, over a year ago. Steph and I set up uh, several stations um, around Easy Pass, uh, which is west of the Metau watershed right along the Cascades Crest. And you can see Steph has climbed this tree. It's, she's, you know, probably 12 or 14 feet off the ground where she's put the bait is at least that high. 
And here is a Wolverine at that piece of bait. So we stepped the other camera up in a tree also off the ground. So that Wolverine's about 14 feet up. And notice those, that white paw there, this is the right paw, uh, or excuse me, the left paw, and totally different part of the range. So definitely not the last animal we showed, but um, that paw is quite distinctive. And here that same animal is again, this, this photo was from the fall in October and it climbed 14 feet up the tree. This one's in late um, February. And you can see the snow is now made up the difference about 10 feet of, uh, of snow is on the ground, but the same white paw there. So pretty sure this is the same Wolverine that came back and is lingering around that area as well, which is kind of an exciting observation. And then we had another station set up um, just a couple, three, four miles away. And we got that same Wolverine again there. And then we got this Wolverine at that same station. We're not sure if this is the same or a different one, obviously a different angle, but there was a number of Wolverine detections we got last winter, which was very exciting. And then the other exciting thing about our last season was that we also documented uh, several other species of conservation interest. This is a fisher, uh, probably a fisher that was released uh, as part of the reintroduction efforts for this creature in the North Cascades. This was all the way on the east side of the North Cascades, again, out of the Holden Village area, uh, Lake Chelan area. And so this, this fisher uh, migrated from all the way on the west side of the North Cascades where all the releases happened around Darrington or New Halo and areas like that um, over to the east side. Perhaps it likes the colder, drier environment like many of us do. Um, that was cool. And we uh, recorded two Canada lynx as well at uh, one station in the early winters uh, watershed uh, here, and then another one up by Hearts Pass in the wow. Metro, uh, watershed proper as well. So that was very exciting as well. The first two uh, links that we've documented in, in three years of research on the project. Really? Wow. And then um, that's a big guy. A few other. Uh, few other things we got here's a golden eagle that was pretty fun uh to, to capture on film and of course no year would be um complete without some american martin shots or pacific martin shots we get about literally ten thousand uh martin photographs to every one wolverine photo we get every year so here's just a couple of the highlights uh, what's he got in his mouth a little mouse type thing um, I don't know who's got their speaker or who's got their, somebody else is unmuted and talking. We can hear you there, so. Um, it says. Uh, that, that's a uh, Martin that's got a little deer mouse. Uh, we found them uh, also running off with uh, flying squirrels and a few other items over the years in those tens of thousands of photographs we've got. Brief summary of um, what we got this past year, there's a bunch of different Wolverine detections. And then I just wanna kind of transition to the other really important and kind of growing part of our um, project, which is the community science effort, which is down below the bottom half of this. Uh, in the first year we did this, we got 20 <laughs> observations from the community. And the following year we got 26. And last year we got 92 observations. Not all of those were Wolverines, but we're just seeing you know really huge growth in the number of um, detect, in the number of observations we're getting from the public. So we're really trying to ramp that up. Uh, we did have, of those 92 observations, nine of them were verifiable Wolverine detections, and those were photographs or videos of actual Wolverines. And then there was a bunch more photographs of tracks, which we categorized as Wolverines. And we're actually currently working on a little experiment to test how reliably we can identify wolverines from photographs of their tracks in snow so that in the future we'll be able to report out both verifiable sightings of wolverines directly and then track track observations that uh, we believe are wolverine and nothing but wolverine as well so that's a piece of work for the years to come but very exciting here's a little snapshot of where we got some of those detections from Obviously, most of it from here in the Cascades, a uh, big, most of it from the North Cascades, um, fairly large number from the South Cascades as well, and then a few outliers. 
There's one from a golf course, I think somewhere out in Idaho um, and somewhere around uh, um, uh, Union Gap in, uh, in Yakima. We don't believe either of those are actually Wolverines. So there you go. Um, and then here I mentioned that in the press release, the Park Service did for uh, the Wolverines that um, Cascades Carnivore Project uh, documented um, in Mount Rainier. We also got a community science observation from down there before the press release came out that went out with the press release. And these are some Cascades Wolverines playing in the snow. Like I said, they love the snow. Some more observations by some of our other community scientists. Uh, and just to recognize, this was Travis Harris. Uh, Lee Yarborough sent these from the uh, um, Tianaway River watershed, uh, which were almost certainly Wolverines. Here's another one, uh, Andrew Cohen sent this along. And this was actually a photograph, I believe, of a track from this animal. If you look right in the middle of that photo in the red box is a Wolverine. And um, I'm totally blocking on where this was. I believe this was in the North Cascades, however. Um, so that was a great observation. Dan Beanhusen um, sent us these photos of a Wolverine while up doing some backcountry skiing in the Glacier Peak Wilderness, which was very exciting. So lots of great observations coming in. And uh, you may be asking at this moment, how do I know if I found Wolverine tracks? And I'm going to share a little bit about how you can know that. But I'll also say, if you think it might be a Wolverine, you should photograph it and send it to us. And I'll talk about how to do that because we'll help you sort out what it was. Here's Steph looking at some tracks. And uh, here's some things you look for. So this is the uh, foot of a Wolverine from a, a dried study skin. This was actually a Wolverine that was um, a roadkill in the Cascades. That's in the Burke Museum five toes on their front and hind feet, this really thin arc pad, a palm pad. And then on the front foot, they've got a little knob down there on the heel of their foot. Um, fronts and hinds look very similar. That's a good clue uh, to help you sort these guys out from something like a bear perhaps. Uh, and here's some photographs of their actual tracks about the size of your hand. That's my hand in there for Scale, I have a huge hand, not really, but a normal size hand. Um, that's a six inch scale in the other one. Um, so you can see um, that arc of toes and then the arc of the palm pad. And I kind of think about it like a little bit like an ice cream cone shape <clears throat> if the heel is showing up. The other thing you'll look for, a lot of those photos I showed you were actually just the track pattern. And actually the track pattern is, is pretty diagnostic. Some of the track patterns for Wolverines are diagnostic in that for the size of the animal, the size of the tracks, um, there's really nobody else that leaves a track pattern reliably like that. So especially that one, two, one lope pattern you'll see on the left or that angled pattern of two, um, those are two patterns that many mustelids leave, but when you get to a trail width of about seven to 10 inches, um, that's when you're thinking you probably have got yourself a wolverine, especially if it's cruising around tree line in the North Cascades. Here's uh, the pattern of angled pattern of two that repeats itself. And here's that one, two, one pattern, that loping pattern. Uh, community scientist Forrest McBrien sent us this one. This is from the Mount Baker area a number of years ago. Here's that one, two, one pattern. It just looks like a line of tracks repeating another line of tracks repeating and uh, with a ski pole down there for scale. Sending us photos with scale in it is very important so that we can, if we don't have a reliable scale in there, we can't say for sure much of anything about what the tracks are. But we'd love for you to send us your observations. And uh, here's another photo from Forrest uh, from a traverse he did across the North Cascades with some Wolverine tracks going one direction and his ski partners going in the other direction. And uh, we're very interested to know uh, where Wolverines and people overlap in the North Cascades and elsewhere in the Cascades. So your observations are actually really vital to our understanding of Wolverines because 
we as professional researchers will just go set a station out and see what comes to it. But when you get observations that you cross in the landscape, then we'll also get a data point for where wolverines are just showing up on their own and where wolverines are showing up in places where people are traveling naturally as well, you being the person doing your natural thing, which might be skiing or hiking or climbing or snowshoeing or whatever. Uh, if you do record tracks, make sure that you catch the uh, date and the time and the location. Uh, try to search around to get the clearest tracks. Photograph the tracks a bunch. Don't just take one photo and send it to us. If you send us 10, that's great. Photograph the individual tracks, photograph the track pattern, photograph the tracks in the landscape so we can see all that. Make sure you put a scale in there so that we can get a sense of size. A lot of times your um, ski poles have demarcated um, centimeters in there. That's great. Your avalanche probe might have that. That's great. Um, at the very least, put something like your ski basket in there and then you can send us also a photograph of your ski basket with a tape measure or we'll ask you to send us that. Uh, you can um, just your skis on your feet can help us as well, especially if you can tell us how wide your skis are. So some sort of scale in there um, in some of the photos at least is really important. And then the specific location, sometimes your phone will capture that information automatically. Uh, sometimes it won't do that. So you can drop a pin on a GPS unit or um, make a mark on a map that you can send us so that we can find the exact location that's helpful. And then I believe Daniel's gonna drop a link to, to this. Um, you can go to our website and get uh, from our website, a link to an online uh, form to fill out and put attached photos to and send us your observations and we'll follow up with you, help you figure out what it is you got. Of course, uh, if that all confuses you, you can just send us a good old email uh, and uh, tag us in photos that you post up on Instagram and we'll help you sort them out that way as well. I'm going to wrap things up here and just say, um, just do a uh, unabashed request for funds. If any of you have $5 or $500 to send our way, um, doing field work like this isn't cheap and we're um, trying to expand our work. And so every cent helps. You can find us like GoFundMe. You can also find this link through our website as well. Uh, if you want to make a tax deductible donation, we're actually a fiscally sponsored program of Conservation Northwest. So you can go to their website and donate to us. Just put Cascades Wolverine Project in the notes for donation. I'll get earmarked specifically for us and our work. You can get a link to that through our website as well. Um, and uh, if you're interested in doing some volunteer work, we have uh, with COVID, we're, we're probably not taking any more volunteers for the field this winter, but there are projects we um, could key folks into out of the field. So send us an email if you wanna do some volunteer work and we might be able to set you up with some COVID friendly projects to help us uh, process uh, photos that we get out of the field um, or with some of our outreach, um, uh, we'll, we'll try to find a home for you for sure. Uh, just so you know, uh, we, like I said, we work with Conservation Northwest and they have a much larger uh, community science camera trapping program, uh, where um, which we've been uh, partnering with them on. So if you wanna help run some camera traps yourself, if we can't get you set up doing that in the Metau, um, Conservation Northwest is always looking for volunteers um, to uh, run camera trap stations for wolverines, wolves, grizzly bears, uh, along Interstate 90, uh, lots of opportunities to get out and get involved uh, in learning about what's going on out there so we can make informed decisions for what we want the, the world to look like in the future. So with that, uh, I will wrap up um, my portion of speaking and uh, hand it back to Daniel, but it's been an absolute pleasure to um, be here with you guys tonight. Thank you so much for um, coming out and I'm looking forward to answering questions you've got. Um, yeah, in the interim, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now, hopefully. Dave, thank you so much uh, for sharing your work, your photos and your story. Uh, I think we all really appreciate hearing from you.
Um, so we have a bunch of questions here in the chat box. Um, the first one is about your camera trap stations and like how long do you leave them set up and how frequently do you check them? Great. So our camera trap stations, um, so I'll just distinguish, we've got kind of two types. One is just a pure research station. Uh, and then the other will do both a research setup and then also a photography setup. And um, the research stations that we set up, we will check um, anywhere from once a month over the course of the winter, or we might set it out for the entire winter. So put it out in October and then check it in the spring. So leave it out for many months. And then where we're running foot photography and flashes and all that stuff, we try to check them at least once a month. And the majority of our research goes on from about January to April, but some of our stations run from October to you know, June even. And then our community science observations come in year round. Totally. That is a lot of work to check all those. Um, there's been a lot of questions about the role of um, wolverines in kind of the ecosystem, as well as kind of maybe some evolutionary advantages for them being in the mountains. So is there an advantage uh, for wolverines to travel in straight lines and up and over peaks, or is that? So wolverines, it's interesting. So wolverines, you'll find wolverines in places where there are no mountains in the, a lot of the boreal forest there's, it's very flat. And um, <clears throat> so they're not necessarily connected to mountains, they're connected to deep snow. And here in the Pacific Northwest, the only place to find that is in the mountains. And so, so here, here, there's this overlap, overlap of these two features. And that um, wolverines are absolutely very well adapted for a mountain environment. So they don't always live in a mountain environment, but when they do, they can travel places that I would be terrified to go, they go without thinking twice. And often they do travel in straight lines. That's some of the research that's been done with GPS collars shows them going like literally over the north faces of big peaks and, and nobody knows if they just enjoy that or if it's the quickest way to get to the other side of the mountain. Um, there are, I've observed wolverine tracks where they actually from the top of a hill just slide right down it. So they obviously like to, I mean, it's probably evolution, you know, maybe it's energy saving to slide down a mountainside, but I think all of us know that sliding down a mountainside also has some advantages as far as being the funnest way to go. So I think they, so I, my guess, and this is just off the cuff, is that part of how they travel in the Alpine environment is because they can. I mean, if I could run up the north face of big mountains without thinking twice about it with nothing but my bare feet, I would definitely do that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Fascinating. And then as far as their role in the ecosystem, the interesting thing about wolverines is that if wolverines disappear, the ecosystem won't collapse. They're not a keystone species like a beaver. Like when beavers disappear, the entire ecosystem changes, right? And it becomes much less diverse. Um, when wolverines disappear from a landscape, it's telling you there's something wrong in that ecosystem. So they're not so much a uh, change agent as an indicator of change. So their presence can, you know, in many ways indicate some healthy aspects of the environment and their disappearance might be a signal that there's a problem. Can you, Dave, think of a species in another ecosystem that wolverines might be compared to? Yeah, so wolverines, um, you might liken them to say a pygmy rabbit out in the sage step where the, they're an obligate to a very specific or a, a um, pronghorn antelope um, or a sage grouse uh, or a polar bear. These are all animals that have a very unique niche that they survive in a very limited, um, very sensitive climatic or ecological environment. And once uh, those conditions are disturbed, it's very hard for them to survive. Awesome. Um, are wolverines exclusively scavengers 
or will they take prey yeah, so live? So wolverines as well? are exclusively carnivores. All they eat is meat. They might eat a couple berries occasionally. I mean, it seems like everything might eat a berry every so often, but pretty much all they eat is meat, and they will eat any kind of meat. If they can kill it, they'll kill it and eat it. If they find it dead, they'll eat it. If they they'll they'll try to get in on wolf kills or mountain lion killed animals and feed on those things sometimes um, to their own detriment um, because the wolves and mountain lions don't actually like to share with wolverines. So that's a dangerous proposition if you weigh 40 pounds. Um, but um, they'll hunt things like smaller game. Uh, they'll probably occasionally take um, fawns or calves, things like that. Uh, if you had really amazing conditions where there was deep snowpack and a deer or a mountain goat was kind of bogged down in the snow and the wolverine had a chance to take advantage of that, it certainly would. But most of the big game that they're eating is not things that they've killed. They'll also dig up through rocks and stuff to get at ground squirrels and other things like that. So small game they'll hunt, big game opportunistically they'll try to kill, but mostly they're scavenging big game. Awesome. How long will they uh, travel in search of food? Oof. You know, they're always traveling. Like, I don't know, I, I don't know off the top of my head what a typical day in the life of a Wolverine might look like. I wouldn't be surprised if it, you know, could cover 15 miles in a day, 20 miles in a day. Um, some of the research that's been done here in the North Cascades with GPS collared animals would probably speak to that. A lot of which is published online. If you look for North Cascades Wolverine, North Cascades Wolverine Research. I can't, I'm sorry, blocking on the name. Somebody else in the, I know there's folks that are involved with that in the audience. Maybe you can post in the messages, but you can read about that and there may be some information, but many, many miles, many more miles cross country than most of us would care to try to tackle in a day. Cool. Um, do you have any knowledge of kind of like the fossil record that we found for Wolverines and, and how long we know they've That's been around. That's a great around. question. And, and I don't know the history of that. Um, uh, I know that they're circum, the fact that they're circumboreal suggests to me that they probably were going, doing some back and forth between North America and Eurasia during the ice ages. Uh, but whether they originated in North America and went to Eurasia or whether they originated in Eurasia and came to North America um, I don't know the story uh, behind that or when they first showed up in the fossil record. They are a, climate, they're a relic of the Ice Age, though. You can think about during the Ice Age, all of Washington was great wolverine habitat, right? And, uh, and a great deal further south was great wolverine habitat. So they've been dreading climate change for a long time. <laughs> and making it work in these little isolated pockets that remain of basically ice age habitat. Very interesting. Uh, the next questions are gonna kind of switch more kind of like data collection and uh, observation collection. Um, how far afield from the Methow Valley are you interested in collecting data? Uh, this person is from the Similkameen Valley, uh, which is near Manning Park, British Columbia. Great about 50 kilometers north, northwest. Yeah, we would there. definitely take observations from Southern British Columbia in the North Cascades. Um, that area would be great if you're getting observations up there for sure. We'd love to know about that. Um, if you're further uh, into British Columbia and like east over into the Rockies, Wolverine Watch has their own community science program you could key into. Of course, we'll take observations from wherever you, they come in from. And um, if it's something important will help try to redirect you. But certainly anywhere in the Cascades, uh, we'd love observations. Great. Um, when taking uh, data points from tracks in a specific geographic region, can you actually tell how many wolverines are using the landscape or measure the population size just from tracks? You know, there has been some work trying to look at whether track censuses can tell you anything about population size. And it's pretty challenging. It's certainly, I'm not familiar with any 
methods that give you a reliable, like there's 17 Wolverines. Um, you could tell if you do a repeated track census, if the population is generally going up or down, uh, but generally track observations will tell us hopefully whether or not there was a Wolverine there and, um, and a little bit about the habitat they're using. If you follow one and take a GPS track of where it went, that's actually really interesting geographic information for us to get. Um, but it also will be a signal to us that maybe we want to do some more detailed research there. So for instance, last year, we got a bunch of observations from the Mount Baker area in a certain area. And so this year we're doing a more targeted, we've got multiple cameras set up out there to try to follow up on those community science observations saying there was tracks there and now we want to go out and figure out, okay, can we get a genetic sample? Can we learn if there's males or females? Um, can we find tracks and follow them and learn more about how they're using the landscape? So the tracks are kind of a good, they're like a gateway observation. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, sticking on the topic of geography, do individuals use the same areas year after year? Yeah, so yes, uh, wolverines have a home range, which is a big area. It could be anywhere from like 100 to several hundred square miles. And, uh, and they won't necessarily, they'll often come back to similar spots again and again. They'll some, you know, kind of do a loop through their, their home range. Um, but there may be some places they never visit or some places they go only once. But in general, they'll typically, once they become an adult, they'll disperse when they're young and find a spot to them for themselves that's unoccupied and live there. And then you'll see males have much less overlap between their home ranges with each other. And females have relative, you know, they may have some overlap in their home ranges, but um, male home ranges will completely overlap with female home ranges. So I, in an ideal Wolverine neighborhood, you'll have both a male and female occupying an area and they won't, um, they don't necessarily try to keep each other out. Whereas males tend to be a little prickly about other males in their territory. Although there is a growing body of observations to show that Wolverines are more social than we once thought. So observations of things like a male dropping in to travel and hang out with like one of his offspring after their offspring has like left their mom. And uh, um, so that's like, wow, that's really interesting. So it's not like just like a, this is my area, stay out of it to other Wolverines. Um, they generally have areas that are more their own. They're generally solitary, but um, that doesn't mean that they're always solitary and that they uh, don't hang out with each other every so often. Does all that overlap in, in ranges um, lead to competition for resources and, and fighting with each other over food? Yeah, I'm not familiar with any observations about wolverines fighting with each other for food. Um, a lot of, if you see multiple wolverines at a kill site together, it's probably siblings with their mother. Um, I don't know if there's observations of males with their offspring or with uh, a mate sharing food, but that whole setup to have separate home ranges is an evolutionary way to avoid competition. So a home range will be big enough, hopefully, for that wolverine to feed itself. And it's important that it kind of has access to as much of that food as possible because food is a limited resource. So by partitioning the landscape, uh, there's less competition between wolverines. So that's one of the reasons that they probably do that. And then also worth noting on that, which is really interesting, as I said, males and females overlap their home ranges, but males and females are very different in size. So males are almost twice as big as females. So in other mustelids, it appears that there's some partitioning of prey where the larger males will feed on larger prey and the smaller females will feed on smaller prey. And so therefore, even though they're overlapping in the same home ranges, there's less competition between them. So I don't know if that happens in wolverines or not. I don't know if anyone knows if it does, but that could be another way that they avoid competing with each other while sharing the same neighborhood. Awesome, another really interesting question. Um, you said they kind of like, at least in Washington, to stick around tree level. Um, can you generalize what altitude that might be here in Washington? Yeah, I mean, about 5, 000, I mean in the North Cascades, about 5,000 feet. It changes north side of the mountains, south side of the mountains, 
Um, but many wolverine trails that I've found, if you follow them, they just are skirting right along tree line and uh, or just drop down a little bit below it and then go back up into the, you know, into that area. So awesome. And do they change their use of the land? Do they change it over the year? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, almost certainly. I mean, as we all know, going for a hike in the North Cascades in the summer and the winter is a totally different thing. So they, Wolverines will have different spots that they're going to look for food in the winter than they would in the spring and summer. So, you know, marmots become interesting prey for them in the summer uh, and uh, in the winter, they're gone. So places where there's marmots are no interest to them because they're all hibernating, unless they can dig down and excavate hibernating mar marmots, which I haven't um, heard about, but could happen. Um, but you know, mountain goats go hang out in certain spots in the winter, and then they'll move to other spots in the summer. So wolverines will shift their use of the landscape based on um, food availability. And then females in the spring, when they have a natal den, then they become really strongly tied to that spot. So once they pick a spot to um, have a litter of kits and raise them, they're much more bound to that area and can't travel nearly as far. So that's a really sensitive um, time for, for wolverines and actually a very important time for us as winter recreators to be um, cognizant of and, and uh, avoid disturbing wolverines. That could be really catastrophic for the North Cascades wolverine population. Okay, last couple of questions here, Dave. How many uh, young do female wolverines usually have? Ooh, I don't know the answer to that. I'll punt that one. I know there's some other wolverine in the <laughs> audience, so maybe something will pop up there. I guess off the cuff, it's probably like three or four, something like that. Nice. I'll, um, test test I'll say four, see if anybody okay. can tell me. <laughs> happy, yeah, happy to get. Dave corrected here in the chat box or live. Um, last question. Do any of the Wolverines that frequent your um, research stations have names? And if so, do you have a favorite? Uh, well, um, uh, the one that I, I know that we feel pretty confident we've gotten several times is a, is a Wolverine in the early winter's watershed named Stella. And that was the original photo I put up of the Wolverine. Um, actually, the first couple photos that I put up of Wolverines at the beginning of the slideshow, one under the early winter spires and, uh, um, and then the other in the forest. And uh, I'd probably say I'm partial to her in part because I think she's the only one that we're sure is a Wolverine that's been named in the past. And, um, uh, but also because she hangs out in some of my favorite spots in the North Cascades. So I think she's got good taste. Perfect. Well, I think that is a great uh, place to end things. Dave, thank you again. And uh, good luck tomorrow getting out on the Lady of the Lake and starting your 2021 field season. You got it. Thanks so much. Good to be out there with you. And thanks to all the great work that Conservancy does. And yeah, it's just great to be with you guys. Thanks so much. Awesome. And thanks everybody out there for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate you. So have a good night. Thank you.